The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Our last presenter will be uh, Brian Pales from Rutgers University. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I don't. I haven't been at Rutgers for four years. I forgot to update my ACI profile for a long time. <laughs> so I work for uh, Vector Corrosion Services these days. So thank you. Uh, today I'll be talking about the effect of cracking on reinforced concrete corrosion, and I will be kind of putting this in the perspective of field examples uh, and projects that I've looked at over the last uh, four or five years with uh, VCS. So obviously. Uh, reinforced concrete corrosion. Concrete is an effective barrier to chlorides, carbonation, and other contaminants that reach the steel. The keys to concrete success with reinforced to protect reinforcement, uh, it has a high pH, so we uh, the steel is passive in that environment. Uh, concrete's low permeability, so it prevents those contaminants from getting to the steel. Uh, and particularly cover depth uh, increases the distance that those contaminants have to take to get to the steel. So, you know, those are three of the primary big uh, successes that concrete has in protecting steel. And obviously with cracking, the kind of effect on cover depth. Cover depth is probably the most important factor in the service life of a reinforced concrete structure. If we, uh, if we take fixed law and we uh, play around with it to look at what time is, we see that distance, x is distance from uh, cover depth, we see that it's exponential. So the better that cover depth is, it has an exponential effect on time to chloride concentration to threshold. Uh, and this is for carbonation, and again, distance is squared. Uh, so if you have the world's best quality concrete, if you don't have any cover depth, it's not really going to help you using that great concrete. So obviously cover depth is extremely important. Uh, however, you know, you know, cracks obviously affect the effect, uh, have an effect on cover depth. Corrosion will lead to cracking. Obviously, iron oxide is expansive, so depending on the iron oxide that you create, you can have a relative size expansion up to seven times. Uh, however, there are non-expansive corrosions, uh, black rust and low oxygen environments. But really, the focus of what I'm going to talk about today is when cracking leads to corrosion, not when corrosion creates cracking. So we have kind of a chicken and egg problem in corrosion and cracking. Obviously, we can create cracking with corrosion, but if we have cracking, it does create corrosion. Uh, and effectively, it's a direct path. That's where it all comes down to. That cover depth, that, that cover depth you're relying on with the high-quality concrete, when you have a crack, kind of negates all of that. Uh, so cracking in concrete provides a direct pathway to the reinforcing for the contaminants. Uh, many, there are a lot of causes of why we get cracking in concrete. Uh, is it concrete shrinkage, uh, mechanical stress doing overloading, uh, improper concrete strength, uh, under reinforced elements, uh, ASR as, as we've heard previously, freeze-thaw damage. And so obviously the uh, service life of a structure subjected to cracking is significantly reduced. And so I'm going to go through several projects where Cracking was the reason we had corrosion, not corrosion that created uh, cracking. And so kind of what, what caused the issue, how it exposed itself in the structure. So, uh, so the first one, I-395 HOV over the Potomac River. Uh, so this is in Washington, D.C. We have a reinforced concrete bridge deck, steel girders, and then we have reinforced concrete piles with masonry clad. Uh, as part of uh, a rehabilitation of this structure, we went in to do an evaluation to look at condition assessment. Uh, so the original deck was overlaid, however there was a lot of shrinkage cracking in the overlay which exposed the deck to high chloride concentrations. As, a, as well, this was a closure pour situation down the center, so down the center of the structure there was a construction joint due to a closure pour. Uh, and that closure pour also allowed for pathways for moisture and chlorides. And then also, you know, cracking, uh, an expansion joint necessarily isn't a crack, but it's still a joint and a pathway for moisture and chloride. So I'll kind of show it a little bit of why, you know, closure expo uh, exposure at expansion joints on the substructure as well. 
So corrosion potential survey of the deck identified that the closure pour was allowing for extreme, uh, an extremely aggressive environment at the construction joint. So here I've kind of highlighted, so we have the reinforced concrete deck and here is the closure pour section. So we have a construction joint on either side here. And here we have just a sampling of corrosion potential survey and we can see almost exactly where that closure pour is down this side and on down that lane. We can see that active corrosion is pretty significant in that area and partly due because a construction joint is allowing moisture and chlorides to penetrate that joint. Uh, we're also getting chloride uh, active corrosion in other areas because of shrinkage cracks allowing chlorides to enter into the concrete. So for example, on this structure, we pulled cores and we looked at chloride contents for sound concrete. And we can see here chloride profile. Uh, we have about 350, about the threshold for chloride uh, initiation, uh, corrosion initiation and chloride exposure environment. And we can see here we have pretty standard chloride profiles, high surface concentrations that diffuse uh, and flatten out. And we can see here the vertical green lines are where the cover depth, uh, the average reinforcement is. And we can see down there we have you know, relatively low chloride concentrations, very typical in a good sound concrete deck. However, when we get to shrinkage cracks and joints on the uh, construction joints, we can see now that the chloride profiles are quite wild. Uh, cracks, you know, we can see that they're level or fluctuating widely. And at the steel depth, we have extremely high chloride concentrations. So the, the chloride uh, diffusion ver crack versus sound is uh, extremely different in these two situations. So we can say, you know, at this construction joint, allowing a lot of moisture to bring in chlorides, very high uh, aggressive environment there. Uh, but in the sound conditions, the, the steel is protected. On the substructure, you know, while we're kind of looking at cracks, you know, we can still kind of say, okay, an expansion joint is a crack in the deck. Uh, if we look at the substructure where there's no expansion joint above it, so this has a continuous deck over top here, we can see that the chlorides are pretty much flat. These are all just background levels. There's no chlorides here, uh, a little bit of exposure, but there's that 350 line I showed you earlier. Well, what if we look at a pier that's under an expansion joint where we allow moisture and chlorides to reach it? Obviously, we see a very stark and significant difference in the condition of that element. Uh, so anytime we're allowing exposure of chlorides and moisture, we see we have a lot of staining, uh, we see that the chloride contents are extremely high in the element. There's no vertical green lines for cover depth on this because of, the, of these mass concrete elements. The steel was much, much deeper. So the, it was actually, it had a lot, a lot of cover. So even though you have a significant amount of cover on these pier elements because they're primarily compression elements, you still have so much chloride, even at almost five inches of depth, we're in the th thousands of parts per million. So obviously we're getting a lot se severer exposure to a joint because of a joint. And then if we look at cracking in these elements, carbonation is another issue that we have to deal with. Not only do we have chloride, chlorides that can enter a crack, but we have the air that can enter in the crack. Uh, carbon dioxide will uh, permeate into the concrete and lower the pH. And so here we have a core that was cut in half. And we can see here that uh, phenolphthalein was sprayed on. The pink is indicating a high pH. Uh, and you can see that at the surface, we see wherever it's, it's um, not pink, where the solution was clear, that is where the carbonation is penetrated. So in the sound area, it's only been about a quarter or a half inch, but you can see where the crack is that it's penetrated significantly deeper into the core. Uh, so carbonation at a crack will penetrate in and lower the pH around the steel. And this will actually be a synergistic effect with the chloride. So you don't need to get to the chloride threshold when you have a carbonation issue as well. So at a crack, not only are you getting chlorides into that crack, but you're also getting carbonation. So that will end up actually lowering your chloride th threshold as well because you're lowering the alkalinity around the steel. So the synergistic effects of those two will actually cause corrosion quicker. Uh, and if you're just relying on chloride data, you may miss that. So there's a bridge. Another structure that we looked at recently was a salt storage monolithic dome. Uh, this dome is actually um, stores bulk raw salt that is then bagged within this facility. And anytime you have literally piles of raw salt in a facility, uh, there's a concern for corrosion. Although the benefit though is it's dry, extremely dry, because the salt's gonna absorb every ounce of moisture within this element. And even when you walk in there, effectively you can feel the moisture being pulled out of your skin. Uh, so that is a benefit. However, when you have cracking, that is a problem. Or uh, shadowing due to, uh, so this was a shotcrete application dome. So they had an internal form liner and then shotcreted on the exterior. 
Uh, however, as anyone who's dealt with shock treating before, uh, shadowing can be a, a problem if you're not careful, if the nozzle man is inexperienced. And so I think everyone can probably see where the reinforcement bars are in this structure because you can see these horizontal, uh, the vertical lines in this photo are not as clear. But uh, obviously these, these uh, honeycombs here are directly behind the reinforcement. So, uh, you know, not only are you in a salt dome, which is already an aggressive environment, but if you're giving direct pathways to your reinforcement, you're not really setting your structure up for the long haul. Uh, and so again, here you can see more shadowing of the reinforcement. Just very, very clearly identify where the steel is because now you've, you're giving pathways directly to that reinforcement. Uh, the structure is also post-tensioned, and I think I bet everyone can point out where the post-tensioning is in the structure because it's cracked right over top of it. Uh, probably some more mechanical type uh, uh, cracking result, but you're still providing direct pathways for chlorides and carbonation uh, to get to the structure. Uh, and kind of the interesting thing about this structure, so obviously chloride profiles, if we look at uh, locations where we have sound concrete, the chlorides are actually not very high in, at the steel depth into the, into the concrete. So if, uh, if this whole structure didn't have any pathways, it actually would be holding up very well because the concrete is preventing the chlorides from permeating into the concrete, primarily because there's almost no moisture. You know, moisture is an important part of the chloride transportation phenomenon. So if you have so little moisture, even though you have pa uh, tons of raw bulk salt, you're not diffusing as quickly. However, obviously at cracks, we're seeing very high threshold, uh, high concentrations. Again, the crack provides a direct pathway. Uh, but you know, something to kind of always look at is carbonation. Um, even in a salt storage dome, uh, where you would think the problem would only be salt. Uh, carbonation is actually, again, a dualistic effect here. Uh, again, here's a core. The carbonation depth at the core surface is, uh, you know, a half inch or so, or a quarter of an inch, sorry. But you can see here's a crack, and we have now carbonation, which is reducing the pH down around the, the steel depth. Uh, so again, uh, we have a pH reduction in the concrete at these openings, and we're getting chlorides in them. So again, we have to be concerned not only uh, about just one of those effects, but the synergistic effects between the two of these uh, contaminants. Uh, I'm going to present a quick little project that actually Tinney Associates were kind enough to let me uh, show. I thought this was, a, I've seen this from them before, and I thought it was a really good uh, example for this talk, so uh, they were kind enough to, to let me show you this. Uh, so this was actually, they did a condition assessment on an aquarium uh, supported by a pier structure. So uh, effectively a marine environment on the underside, and an aquarium, so a marine environment on the inside as well. And one of the kind of interesting things from this uh, investigation that they found was there was a construction joint, which is a little hard to see with the, the image here, but there's a construction joint right here on this beam. And they did a corrosion potential survey, and they found that right at the construction joint, the potentials went very, very negative, extremely negative really quickly. Uh, but there was no delamination or, or corrosion staining, so it was kind of like, well, okay, that's kind of interesting. Usually you would see some kind of... Uh, uh, deterioration of the concrete when you have a lot of corrosion activity. Uh, so they decided to do an opening, which was a very smart thing to do, uh, and they found that the bars at the construction joint were completely severed. Corroded ha corrosion had completely severed these bars at the joint. Uh, obviously, a lot of moisture travel through this construction joint allowed for the removal of the corrosion products. So you're getting a lot of moisture and salts coming into the construction joint, but you're also getting that movement out. So while uh, you're not getting the expansive properties of the read of the, I'm sorry, of the corrosion of the ferric oxide, because you're actually removing those products through that joint as well. Uh, and so as a result, you know, they had complete 100% section loss in those bars along that joint. And if you were just doing a visual sounding, you would have never found that. You would have just assumed, oh, it's sound concrete, it looks great. But obviously, uh, these bars are completely uh, gone. So another project that I, um, I did recently was looking at a bridge in Peach Street. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Peach Street Bridge. This is in Kunsttown, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and this is one where freeze-thaw damage led to the corrosion activity. Uh, this is a three-strand bridge, uh, and so they had a lot of freeze-thaw damage. Uh, so it's just a small little kind of a historic nature bridge in the area. Uh, and they had corrosion and, and spalling, and they, uh, they were wondering what the exact issue was. So we went in and did uh, chloride, uh, we pulled cores, we did chloride testing, and obviously we see that freeze-thaw is a major issue on this structure. Uh, we have sub-parallel cracking throughout the element. 
uh, and we, you know, had a, a petrographic examination done on the core. You can see a lot of uh, a lot of cracking in the polished section as well. So again, any type of crack, whether it be you know a construction joint, a shadowing effect from the welded wire fabric, or here, no air entrainment in a freeze thaw environment, uh, allowed for the subparallel cracking, which then allowed for. Uh, a lot of chlorides to reach into the steel, which would then result into this. So obviously, this is a very old structure because we have twisted rod bar here, which uh, is not used at all today. Uh, but you see here are the stirrups that are no longer stirrups. Uh, because of the, the twisted rod bar is so large, the corrosion activity on it is quite actually not too bad. Uh, but because of the stirrups are so small in diameter, uh, obviously those are all corroded off. So. Uh, you know, the initial cause for the corrosion in this situation was not chloride diffusion, it was actually freeze thaw that allowed the chlorides to get there. Uh, and then, you know, we have this kind of spalling and deterioration that then occurs after that. Uh, and so with that, you know, it was kind of kept it quick. We were a little bit behind there, but, uh, uh, you know, I just wanted to kind of show where there are various situations where construction, you see cracks or, or construction joints that can lead to corrosion. It's not the corrosion isn't the cause of those cracks. So any questions? Do we have any questions for Brian? All right. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you.